Welcome to Conversations on the Coast, the Bay Area's premier author interview program. And today we're going to talk about what I believe to be a very important, uh, significant, and inspirational book. It has the title of Life, Inc., that's I-N-C, period, and the subtitle is more forthcoming, How the World Became a Corporation and How to Take It Back. The author, Douglas Rushkoff, is sitting right here, and the book is published by Random House. Thanks for coming by. Uh, thanks for having me. You know, you, you've written a book that is, uh, at turns, depressing, always honest, and as I said, sometimes inspirational. Uh, the book, I think we can say, was inspired by something that books are not frequently inspired by, a mugging. Yeah, I actually, it was uh, Christmas Eve a few years ago when I got mugged in Christmas front of my- uh, Eve. Christmas Eve? Oh my Eve goodness, I yeah. forgot that part of it. <laughs> Apparently there's lots of muggings on Christmas Eve because criminals are desperate to make sure their daughters get the that's Barbie true. doll that but, they're asking for. <laughs> that's right, yeah. And they need real cash to do it. And this mugging uh, happened in a- in a uh, you know, really nasty place right in front of your house in Park Slope, Brooklyn. Yeah, sort of the the New York equivalent of, of Rock Ridge or something. Yeah. A nice, uh, a, a nice newly gentrified um, part of Brooklyn where I was already overpaying for a, a rental apartment in an area with mostly people who own their places. <laughs> but I uh, posted on this uh, very nice lefty crunchy uh, email list uh, called Park Slope Parents. I posted where I got mugged and what happened and um, the first two emails I got in response to the uh, to mine were from people angry that I had posted the exact location of where I had gotten mugged because this might hurt their property values should they decide to sell at some point in the near future. So it, it kind of sent me off on this journey. You know, how had people come to value the the short term uh, market value of their home more than the long term experiential value of their neighborhood? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's crazy. It but, seems crazy. You know, but it was it, crazy. It, it, in, in in a sense, it's a wonderful snapshot of what you're trying to get across in the book, right? That, of where, the way human beings have internalized the values of corporations, where we are more ruled by our debt structure than by really any of our hopes and dreams or connections to one another as people. That's that's the key word it, throughout the book. The negative of that word disconnect. disconnect. That really is very important, and that's what you're talking about here. They're not connected to you. They probably never knew you, and they're not connected to the neighborhood, which is what you were concerned about and why you posted the damn thing in the first mm -hmm. place. And all they're concerned about is yeah. the effect on their property values. So it sent me on something of a, a, a history uh, a history research mission to find out what was the process by which we had become so disconnected from from place to think of it as property or even from property to think of it as mortgages mm. from people to think of them as consumers from our value to think of our value as some job rather than the creation of some value how had how had that happened and you know I I had to go all the way back really to the Renaissance and the the birth of corporations and the birth of centralized currency to look at how we had become really a, a debt society. You say at, at one point with, that we are, that now instead of acting like people, we're acting like corporations. I mean, we've learned our lessons well, I guess. Yeah, you know, and it's, you know, we, we, we see the world through the window of our, of our Quicken accounts, you know, and the balance there. We, we judge the health of our nation by the Dow Jones Industrial Average or the GDP, you know, and you know, the, the GDP goes up. If everyone caught cancer today, the GDP would go up. So it may not be the best metric to judge the health of the nation. Probably, <laughs> probably not. I, please, I hope you're not prophetic here. <laughs> and when, when you use the corporation as, as it were, a role model, right. as it were, the, 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 the savior, we, we then are left to engage our fellow human beings as competitors. To right. be to be beaten out, uh, or or resources perhaps to be to be exploited. Right. I mean, really, with the with the the birth and triumph of the corporation, people went from being uh, creators and exchangers of value. 
In other words, I would make something and sell it to you. You would make something and sell it to me, which is not dirty. It's just business. It's commerce. It's all beautiful. We went from being people who do that directly to people who do it through corporations. You work for a corporation and get a salary. You use that salary to buy something from the corporation I work for. And other people and institutions are really extracting value from us rather than letting us just engage with one another as people. And everything becomes more and more depersonalized. Right. Necessarily. I mean, with that kind of a system. It does. You know, and we like to say that all this allowed for great specialization, but it really didn't. What it did was made people who were specialized became managers, and they wanted to go and find the most unskilled laborers possible that they could train in 15 minutes and then fire if they didn't like. You know, this book, Life Inc., claims that for nearly 500 years— We've been living in a society ruled by corporations. What's that? Stay tuned. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster COC or send an email to Jim Foster COC at gmail.com. The title of the book today is Life Inc. How the World Became a Corporation and How to Take It Back. Douglas Rushkoff is the author. And, uh, A very interesting gentleman by the name of Tim O'Reilly, the founder and CEO of O'Reilly Media, says in part that uh, hand-wringing over the state of the global economy, think again. Douglas Rushkoff explains why this is a -a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to remember what matters and to rethink our economic system so it reinforces our human values. It's a profound and important call to action. And it is, and we're going to get into those steps hopefully in the in the in the third segment. Right now, I want to look at the at, at the thing uh, uh, historically. There is a, a a phrase that you use that I hadn't seen before, called corporatism. How far back does that go? Well, corporatism, <clears throat> I mean, as a as a an idea, really goes back uh, to Mussolini, who uh, believed really before Hitler was even around Mussolini. Well, originally Mussolini was a was a lefty, but that's besides the point. He he eventually came to his wits and realized he could rise to power more quickly as a righty <laughs> and um, an extreme righty. And he decided he believed that government, uh, that government and the corporation would really should serve each other. That they should be part of the same basic entity. And uh, sometimes when I read the news or see the way that. No, say that Obama is bailing out the banks that were the ones who robbed us in the first place, I think, oh my gosh, we're in the same situation now. That you can't call it right, you can't call it left. I mean, Obama's on the left in theory, but here he is um, using our grandchildren or great-grandchildren's money to bail out companies that have been extracting our wealth for the last decades. Yeah, and and the way it looks like his time is that we're in an era now, obviously, of managed capitalism. Right. Managed by the United States government, paid for in every way by the United States taxpayers. Right. And it's it's very hard for people who've been raised in this economy to think that value comes from from our work, that people create value. You know, Obama's stuck in this paradigm where he thinks the way you create value is by lending money, that you you inject cash mm-hmm. into the system and then there'll be value. When the fact is, I was just saying to the, the editor of Rolling Stone the other day, you know, that, that money doesn't make music, music makes money. <laughs> you know, it's like you don't you don't you don't make stuff out of money. Money is the result of of work, and while it's great to have some money around to do investment in big projects, if you want to build a ship or you want to start a big company, but not everything has to start that way. Money is not a prerequisite for us to get the things we need from one another. Now, what this creates, this approach, corporatism, creates something that I think you call the corporate consumer, and and this is. Uh, uh, in a way saying that we ourselves have become corporations. We imitate corporations in our lives. Well, yeah, it's hard. I mean, once you're a, 
once you're living on a landscape or in an economy that's defined by corporate activity, it's really hard to see yourself as something else. I mean, when everybody's working for a big company, rather than transacting with one another, then we're all basically workers in competition with one another for the scarce jobs and resources trickle down to us. You know, once once we have a currency that is lent into existence by banks rather than earned into existence by people, then we're all competing for that scarce resource, for that scarce amount of currency that that the king or Citibank, you know, doles out. You know, we're all competing against each other to be able to pay back our mortgages. And that's a strange situation to be in with people competing against each other and corporations really not competing against each other at all. You know, now, on, on an historical note, you see this going back – Actually, you, you seem to posit two different uh, starting points. One is the Renaissance, uh, and then the second one is uh, the, the time when kings kind of took over, and they declared certain companies royal, mm -hmm. and, and which gave them carte blanche to go out and do business any way they wanted to, just as long as they brought back the shekels yeah. uh, all over the world. Yeah, I mean, I kind of look at, the, at, at two, and I see them both as Renaissance innovations. You okay. know, one is the corporate charter, you know, the chartered monopoly, and the other is centralized currency. And they were both invented for the same reason. There was a rising merchant class, a middle class that was getting very rich, and it was at the wealthiest class's expense. The aristocracy was losing power. They were relatively less wealthier than everybody else. So they came up with two things. They needed instruments. They needed mechanisms that allowed people who had money but created no value mm -hmm. to keep their money, to make money. How do you make money simply by having money? So the two things they came up with is one, a corporate charter, which means that if you still have authority over the laws, I can now assign a particular corporation to be in charge of an industry. You're the East India Trading Company. You're in charge of America. And the second was money. You know that I can issue money at a certain rate of interest, and now you're going to have to pay it back. So what can we do? Life, Inc., devotes a whole chapter to answering this question, and that's where we're going when we come back. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster COC or send an email to Jim Foster COC at gmail.com. This is Jim Foster. It is Conversations on the Coast. The title of our book today is Life Inc. by NC period. Subtitle how the World Became a Corporation and How to Take It Back. The author is Douglas Rushkoff. And the publisher, I don't know whether we've credited them, is Random House. Right, a oh. subsidiary of the Bertelsmann Group. Everybody Inc. is. <laughs> <laughs> a, a, a very wonderful author, Naomi Wolf, I like her, she's good, says there are few more important subjects in the West today than the corporate corporatization of public and personal space and few writers as well suited to the subject as the always insightful and provocative Doug Rushkoff. Oh, she knows you. Mm -hmm. Okay. A terrific contribution to an urgent debate, she concludes. Now, the, the, the debate is, is urgent, but I think even more urgent is to leave people with some ideas of what can be done. Some ideas of what can be done, I think most centrally, uh, to, to, to bring people back together in some kind of sense of community, to close the gap which corporate, the, the corporations have created for their own good purposes. Well, one way, I mean, the easiest way to close the gap is to stop, like corporations do, um, to stop outsourcing everything we do to some distant company, to stop outsourcing your savings and investment to some Wall Street bank who's going to be investing it in some other thing very far away. Stop you know, outsourcing the care of your children in your neighborhood to some you know private school or facility, to stop you know outsourcing your employment, to some corporation because it somehow makes you feel safer to work for a big corporation than to create value for people around you. Yeah, you're more secure, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, exactly. And how many times do we have to learn that we're not secure before we learn that we're not secure? <laughs> you know, the other, the other thing that you point out that we so 
you know, adroitly, as it were, outsourced is our charity. All right? right. We got PayPal. We've got the checkbook. And it's a great cause. And Harry Schwartz is, you know, the front guy. We know Harry. Harry is wonderful. I write the check. Mm -hmm. And that really only scratches the surface. Well, it's really just pushing money around. I mean, even if you look at, you know, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, they've got billions of dollars. The billions of dollars that are sitting now invested are doing as much harm as the billions of dollars that they're spending is doing good. You know, they're invested. L.A. Times did a great expose on that. They're invested in companies that are vested in the very things that the foundation is supposedly fighting. Oh, so no. you're sort of working against yourself when you do things that way. I see the banking crisis and the corporate crisis, the paralysis of the economy as a terrific opportunity for us to build another economy in its place. And it's not as complicated as all that. While I'm a big fan of complementary and local currencies, and you can look them up and see how they work, they're, they're, they're like one step better than barter in terms of you just get credits for doing stuff. Um, it's very easy to just do things for other people and have things done for you. Most of the goods and services you need can actually be provided by other people. It's as simple as joining a CSA, Community Sponsored Agriculture Group, right. you know, subscribing and putting in some time where you don't have money, taking care of people in your neighborhood. You know, actually doing things for one another is not charity. It's what it's what's being part of a community or a gift economy. Well, there's something going on in your own community called Comfort dollars. Yeah, it's great. There was a restaurant that we all depend on this restaurant. They're the only good organic restaurant in our town. And we need it bigger. And not only does the owner need it bigger, but we as a community need it bigger so we don't have to wait online so long and so everyone can get fed. And he got half the money he needed to expand from the bank, and then the bank shut down. So what's he going to do when we develop something? Yeah. <laughs> of course Of the course bank the bank shut, shut down. down. The yeah. bank the bank closed its uh, its its tap for him. So instead of getting money from a bank, he got money from us. We bought something called Comfort Dollars. So you spend $100 and you get $120 to spend at the restaurant. So now I've gotten a 20% return on my money. I've made sure that I keep this restaurant in my town. He gets money cheaper than he got it from the bank, and I've seen and experienced the benefit of my investment. And the money stays in your town. Right. Doesn't go, you know, elsewhere. Right. It's not being elsewhere. sapped out by, uh, by Walmart's shareholders, but it's actually being recirculated to people in my community. Which is great. Which is great. And you have a wonderful cautionary note in this, in this chapter. The temptation to save the whole world and get the credit comes at the expense of steps we might better take to make our immediate world a more fruitful, engaging, sustainable, and satisfying place. So stop being such a big head and do what you can where you can, I guess is your advice. Yeah, I mean, the temptation is to join some big movement and go online and find out where the meetings are and go to a big march and, you know, and there's going to be lots of pretty people there. But um, it, it's, it's usually disillusioning because it usually doesn't work. The only line you're supposed to go on is the line at your independent bookstore to buy Life, Inc. It's by our friend now, Douglas Rushkoff, and it has been Conversations on the Coast, and I'm Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster C-O-C, or send an email to jimfostercoc at gmail.com.